Good morning. That was a real faith statement that we're going to finish early today. <laughs> and we're not going to force anyone to do the survey, but the doors will be locked. <laughs> Jesus is, I mean, what a topic. They said, preach about Jesus. And uh, I could do the next three or four weeks on this, so uh, I need very little preparation to talk about Jesus. But they were a little bit specific as we were talking about it, that talk about him as the creator. So do you know that the very first verses of Genesis, it was Jesus who was there? Not Jesus of Nazareth, the eternal Son of God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He who manifested himself and revealed himself as Jesus thousands of years earlier. This very first book of the Bible, God is presented as speaking the creation into existence. God just speaks and that word that he speaks, it just happens. Creation occurs. Let's read from this majestic chapter 1 of, of Genesis. It says, in the beginning, God, you can put Jesus there, created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty and darkness covered the deep waters and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light and there was what? light. He thinks creatively, he speaks it, and immediately it occurred. Isn't it interesting that light is the ultimate kind of creative force in our universe? Nothing happens in this world of ours. There would be no life if there was no light. And uh, so everything that you eat Everything that you eat comes from light. Hey, that's not true. Everything that you eat, that plant, that animal, comes from light. I can prove it to you. Having done a sub-major in biological science, and if you remember at primary school, when they do little experiments, they put a seed in a Petri dish, remember, and you grow the plant, and the plant grows up, but then you block the light. So light only comes from this side. You know that plant's going to go... You block it this side, the plant will go that way. Don't believe me, do the experiment. So there's something in that plant called chloroplast, chlorophyll, and it grabs the light energy, and there's a, an amazing chemical reaction that occurs, and it produces starch, and the sheep eat the starch, and you eat the sheep. So what you eat is light. Yes? Is that logical? Anyway, that's just a little biological lesson. But uh, it says, in the beginning, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And throughout the whole chapter, it says, then God said, and there was. <laughs> and there was. Interestingly, in the beginning of the New Testament, that's the Old Testament, you say, Bill, come on. It doesn't say Jesus there, it says God. Okay, But we believe and acknowledge that he actually is God. And the writers of the New Testament, that particularly John, who was one of Jesus' disciples, you've got to read, we've got to read the beginning of his chapter. So when he begins his gospel record, he deliberately parallels the opening words of Genesis. So you can grab Genesis 1 there and grab the gospel of John chapter 1. And instead of God speaking creation into existence, he presents God as speaking salvation into existence. But this time, God's word takes on a human form and enters history in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus speaks the word and it happens just like it occurred in Genesis 1. So let's read this really revealing uh, chapter. It's a wonderful chapter, or the first few verses. It's deeply meaningful and it's beautifully written. John chapter 1 in the New Living Translation says, In the beginning the word already existed. 
the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through Him. He is talking about Jesus, the Creator of this physical world and universe. And nothing was created except through Him. The Word gave life to everything that was created. And His life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. God sent a man, his name's John the Baptist, to tell about the light so that everyone might believe because of his testimony. John himself was not the light. He was simply a witness to tell about the light. The light, the one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world, the eternal Son manifests himself as Jesus of Nazareth. He enters into time and space, our world. He came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, the Jewish people, and even they rejected him. Oh, but what about you and what about me? But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. This creator, Jesus, who created the physical universe, the physical world of Genesis 1, we know it went terribly wrong. We know that human beings who were made in the image of God, decided to turn away from him. Genesis chapter 3 is a terrible chapter where the beginnings of sin and evil and suffering and pain and sickness and death comes into the world. And the history of the world is that. And God could have righteously condemned and judged every single person. But he found a way to deal with that sin issue, to deal with with that barrier that was an impassable barrier between lost humanity, our first parents and every other human being, and a perfect God. And the only way was that he himself would visit the planet. This eternal creator son would appear one day and break into time and space and take on the form of, of a human being. And this Christmas we celebrate his birth baby Jesus. But you can't understand the Christmas story unless you link it with the Easter story, what happened there. Because he came and revealed to us what the Father is like, but more importantly, and he taught, and some of his teachings are recorded and, and we imbibe them. But most importantly, half the Gospels center on the final week of his life because he had to die on a cross to take away the sin of the world. The eternal Father, the eternal Son, the eternal Holy Spirit who created the heavens and the earth, appeared as a human being to die in our place. My mind can scarcely take it in. But this is what John says here. He is the creator and he is the recreator. A new spiritual world of salvation. That lost condition can now be redeemed or brought back or solved. And he says, but to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn. So the word, verse 14, became human and made his home among us. He was full of grace, unfailing love. And he was full of truth, faithfulness. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the, of the Father's one and only Son. Isn't that a beautiful passage? Wow. Maybe you haven't seen the linkage between the parallelism between John 1 and Genesis 1. But John is very careful saying, this Jesus made everything. He put the atoms together. And if he could do that, he can recreate your spiritual life. He can connect you to the Father so that you can be safe and secure for eternity. And no devil, no sin can separate you once you've believed on him and say, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are the God-man. You died for me. You rose again. You live for me. You've sent your spirit to come and live within me. Those things can't change. When you, when you believe and you accept, you're reborn. And if you're reborn, it's like 
natural birth, I will always be a Vasilakis. I can change my name by deed poll, but that means nothing. I have a daddy and I have a mummy, and they're in heaven, and they were born in the little island of Vicaria, near the coast of Turkey, and that's forever. I am a Vasilakis. I am born. I can't be unborn. I can't go back into my mother's womb and start again. So he says here, when you are born again, when you're born from above, when you're born by God, by believing and receiving him, this is for eternity. And you might, as Tim wisely shared with us, you might be going through a shaky, flaky time and, and you may have fallen over, you may have sinned. That sin cannot separate you from the gift of eternal life and from a loving father. Your fellowship might be marred a little bit. It's a bit like when you have a fight with your wife or when your wife has a fight with you rather <laughs> and she breaks fellowship with you. Does that mean, okay, take this ring off. No, 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 we're married for life. And we say, hey, when we get married, we believe it's for life. We know there are circumstances that happen where, where that breaks and, and maybe rightly so for some people. But in the normal course of events, it, it's permanent. Your relationship with God is permanent. You can't get unborn. It doesn't matter what you're going through. And more than that, he has enough power to be able to help you in your time of temptation or in your difficulty or in your struggle. He has a grace and power through his presence, through the Holy Spirit that can help you. And that's why we come to church and why we read our Bibles and share together to be strengthened, to, to be able to live the life that he wants us to live. And so we are born again from above. So John tells us that Jesus was the author of the first creation, this physical world and universe that we live in, but he is more importantly sharing with us that Jesus is the author of the second creation, a spiritual recreation. That's who our Jesus is. Folks, I don't know about you, but very few people who hear the full story of Jesus, I mean the full story, and learn the true facts about his life, his teachings, his crucifixion, his resurrection. Very few people just kind of walk away without it affecting them. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's okay for you. I'll just you know, shrug their shoulders and, and walk off. Very few people that I know. In my 45 years of being a Christ follower and talking to a lot of people, um, most people just don't dismiss him as being unimportant when they get the facts about him and just think a little bit about who he is and also the person who is saying it to them if they have a relationship with that person if that person is credible they will listen now if people are ignorant about Jesus story and there's a lot of mythology people think oh yeah I know about Jesus or they're misinformed about him. And people, people come up with things. People say, oh, yeah, Bill, I try and live by the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah, I, I really adapt my life, but this Jesus bit. And I say, you what? You, try, you live by the Sermon on the Mount? And I tell them, I can't. I fall over all the time. What? But you're a Christian. You're a pastor. No, no, I can't do it. Because I can't do it without Jesus. I can't do it without him. You can't take his teachings and say, I'm going to try and live by them. You can't. He lifts the standard so high that you look at it and go, man, I'm going to fall over on this one. He lived the perfect life for us and he accredits it to us. His obedience covers our disobedience. That's the point of the cross. It's not like me trying to be obedient to somehow win grace. He was perfectly obedient and that covers all my disobedience. He never failed and that covers all my failures. And so therefore, I, I read the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest statement ever written. Even non-Christians acknowledge that. Greater than what Confucius and Buddha and Muhammad and all the other religious leaders and philosophers. The Sermon on the Mount is the pinnacle. It's the number one moral, ethical statement. But nobody can live up to it, really, without a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, the resurrected Christ 
who comes to live within us through the Holy Spirit and taming this wild heart of ours to be able to align to the great precepts of the Sermon on the Mount. I fail without Jesus. You fail without Jesus. And so when people say that, it's just ignorance. And in fact, it's deceptive because they haven't. Even, I said, well, have you read the Sermon on the Mount? Oh, not really, but you know, do unto others is what. I said, well, just that one, do unto others. Treat other people exactly as you want to be treated. So let's think about that. You treat others exactly how you want to be treated. How do you want to be treated? And list them all down. And he says, now you treat others like that. Wow. Wow, I haven't seen it that way. Okay. Or when he talks about sexual purity or kind of anger. And he says, okay, you know, the Old Testament says you do this and you're in trouble. He goes, I'm telling you, you think this and you're in trouble. Whoa! I think this all the time. I want to half kill this person and I'd like to do this and like to do that. And, and whoa, how do I tame this devil of anger? This devil of lust in my nature. How to control anger, impurity. How do I control that beast within me as Johnny Cash sang? Beautiful song towards the end of his life, the beast in me. He talks about the sin nature. Only Jesus can crucify that beast on a cross and give us new life so that it stays buried. That's why we get baptized in water. To say, down boy, you're dead. Your old life is dead, 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 dead. Stay dead. And look to Jesus, the resurrected one, who can keep you sane and sensible and focused and to live as we want to live. In spite of our weaknesses, in spite of our failures, in spite of our mistakes, we so need him to save us and to keep saving us and to be able to sustain us. He is the eternal creator. And as majestic as the physical creation is, the spiritual recreation is even more majestic. Because to tame a human heart, to cause the will of a man to bend, to obey, with all the forces of darkness and memories and, and will, self-will, to actually tame a human heart and to convert it, to recreate the orientation of a person's life, it's much harder for God to do that than to create something physical. That's easy. Because there's no resistance to the inanimate. Make a tree. It just happens. It's not going to resist. Make a human being that's a free agent with memory and will and emotion and choice and volition. Man, the recreation is a much greater miracle for God. And Jesus is the only one that can recreate our life and introduce us to the Father and bring salvation to being. Can you see what I'm saying here? My own conversion story, I can't help but not reflect on it. It's, it's, it's a constant before me of how God saved my miserable soul. When I say miserable, made in the image of God, but kind of bent, living for sin and self and, and indulgence and wildness and and in my story, I wasn't looking for him. A lot of people are looking for him and find him. A lot of people are in trouble and have a lot of needs and they, they need help and then Jesus helps them. For me, I thought I was okay, Jack. I'm living my, my life okay. I, I enjoyed my sin and uh, was happily living a self-centered, indulgent life. But my best friend comes to school, and I knew him since primary school. He's a German boy. So the Germans and the Greeks, we controlled the school. We were, the ethnics ran that school, so we were pretty important. And he was naughty, I was naughty. Put a German and Greek together, big trouble. Well, he comes to school one day, and I looked at him, and I could see he was different. It was like he's walking there, and it's like he's glowing. What's up with him? Like he looked handsome. <laughs> like there was this kind of glow. It was like there was a light on him. It wasn't a light. There wasn't anything physical, but I could see something in his face. And I said, Reinhardt, what's up? 
What's happening? What's happened? And he goes, oh, I've had a weekend. I'm like, well, yeah, I'll tell you, my, what, what happened to you? He goes, oh, because I just, so I say, you look different. Tell me, what's going on? What's up with you? And he goes, Bill, I've come to know God. Just look at me like that. I've come to know God. And I'm thinking, what the heck are you talking about? I'm there, what, what do you, what, what's going on? And he goes, I, cause I, I've got this personal relationship with Jesus now. And I'm there, give me a break. Jesus is dead. Like, what's up with you? So he said all the wrong things. This is not how to win. This is not how to establish a good witness. You go up to somebody, I know God. <laughs> I have a personal relationship with Jesus. That's, it's kind of odd to, to do that up front to somebody. But. If you know that person and you're in a relationship with them of trust and love and you know their authenticity, that they're not a crazy person, then you, go, then you listen and say, okay. And I said, explain to me more. Well, what are you talking about? And he's trying to explain to me and I'm thinking, this is... But he goes, he goes you just got to come and see. You, you, gotta, you come to this meeting. Go and tell, come and see. Okay, she said, come and see. So I went and saw. The week after Easter 1971, you know what? I haven't stopped coming to those meetings ever since and it's 45, 45 years. Because I just want to see more and more and more of Jesus. And so I came to these meetings and I could not believe that people were talking to God, were singing songs to Him. His presence was there. That, that I felt His presence. And yet I didn't want Him. I wasn't looking for Him. But I just knew that I was dealing with somebody who was more than a man. I knew that. Intuitively, instinctively, I knew that I'm dealing with somebody that's more than a man. And so I'm listening and I'm watching, observing. Then I grabbed my, my Gideon's Red Bible. You know those little ones you get at school? or They used to be red, could hardly read them. And I picked it, got it out of my bookshelf and it gathered dust, showed you how I had not read it for the five years or so. And I started reading the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, just started reading them, reading and reading them. And, um, and so it took six months, six months of thinking, reflecting, attending. And I instinctively knew and felt that I was being lovingly confronted with a most remarkable greatness. That he was more than just a man. And, uh, and I tell you, that's what most people experience when they are confronted with the true facts about Jesus. You give me a human being, give me five minutes with them, ten minutes with them, to share my story, and they'll never be the same again. Never be the same again. I know that. Because you cannot hear the story, you cannot, from a credible person, and I'm very credible, intelligent, handsome, achieving, you know, kind of, they know who I am, and so they know I'm not a, a, a funny person, educated, so give me five minutes with them. They may not believe then and there, but I'll tell you what, they'll never be the same again. Because I'll tell them about this creator Jesus created the heavens and the earth, this spiritual recreator Jesus who confronted me and met me and revealed himself to me and changed my life and 46 years later, I know him, love him, talk with him every day and he talks to me. What do you do with that? It's either true or he is the biggest liar, he is the biggest liar or he is a, a, a lunatic and I'm a, either a liar, or I mean not a liar, a, a deceived lunatic. Or he is the Lord of life. There's no neutrality with him, with Jesus Christ. That's why, even in our modern world, you can go on television, you can go, you know, on the media and talk about spirituality and God out there. Just mention the name of Jesus and see what happens. It all shuts down. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, like, oh, yeah. It's like, because he's so unique. 
He is so exclusive. There's only one way to come to God the Father through Jesus the Son. So after nearly six months of being wooed by him and lovingly confronted, I surrendered almost against my own will. <laughs> Amazing when I think about it. Almost against my own will. Two months I stopped coming to church and I thought, I just need to get my head around this. Am, am I really going to, to believe or not? Because I knew instinctively he's more than the man. I knew he was real, that he was God. But I also knew that if I believed and accepted him, it would mess up the way I'm living. It was a moral issue. It wasn't an intellectual issue. I knew it would mess up the way I'm living. I had to make some changes that I knew had to take place. That I cannot live this way and say that I'm a Christ follower. So that was a significant hurdle. And so I remember that Thursday night after reading my Gospels, or David Hersey came chasing after me because he hadn't seen me at church because, Bill, we miss you. You know, he didn't come and say, where were you? Where were you? Missed you, bad boy. He said, Bill, hey, we, we've been missing you. Everything okay? He was interested in me as a person. I said, David, I said, I'm all okay. I've just got to get my head around this. I said, is, is it for me or is it not for me? And so I remember that Thursday night when I just yielded and said, I believe. I believe it all. I didn't even pray, I didn't bow, I just said, I believe it. Yep, it's true, it's all true. He's real. He's God in human form. Yep, boom, boom, boom. And so therefore it meant I had to, then and there, in making that decision, yield my life to him. I could no longer live for myself. So on the Sunday, I couldn't wait to get to church and I put my hand up and I want to accept Jesus, came running out the front. David Hersey's there to counsel me, thinking he's going to do some deep and meaningful. He said, David, I know it all, don't worry, I'm saved. I know what's going on. So we just talked and fellowshiped. And as, as we left, as I left, I'm crossing over Sturt Street. This is as true as can be. This is a hard-headed, rational, realist Greek boy. He's walking across Sturt Street, and he stops in the middle of the road, going, what the heck? What's just happened then? I'm floating. I felt I was actually, my feet were off the road. I mean, I walked a bit. Well. I thought, what is going on? And I just kind of just gingerly walked like I was just floating on air, like it was a hovercraft underneath my feet, like I'm, you know, some kind of travel. I didn't realize that it was all the guilt, the fear, the shame, the sins that had been piling up because I was living a wild life that were somehow just removed. And it was like a sense of lightness of being overwhelmed me that I just knew, that I knew my sins were forgiven. I knew that God was my father. And as I go into dad's beautiful new white valley and, and I put the key in, I'm thinking, you know what? If I got killed tonight, I'd be happy. I know where I'm going. Not that I wanted to die. It wasn't anything like a death wish. Like, you know what? If I got killed, some crazy person painted me and I died, I know where I'm going. And that assurance of salvation over a period of six months as I'm working it through, thinking it through, has never left me. And it's real. And you can have the same assurance of salvation. You can know him not just as the creator of the universe, but as the one who can recreate your life and you have an absolute assurance that no matter what happens, you've got the gift of eternal life, you will live forever and ever, you're reborn. You won't have the same experience as me, not everyone has that. You may be a church kid growing up in the church and, and you don't have that kind of lifestyle issue. But you can have the same assurance of salvation that you know that you know that you know that you know that you know. The Apostle Paul, I've got to give you one more verse and then we'll finish up and do the survey. Quick, one more verse. Yeah, this is good. Is it all right? I'm getting excited. This is just one more verse. Come on, the Apostle Paul, his description of Jesus in his letter to the Colossians, is just mind-stretching and life-changing. Let's read this in the message. This is Eugene Peterson's version. We look at the sun and see the God who cannot be seen. Think about that. We look at the sun and see God's original purpose in everything created. For everything, absolutely everything, above and below, visible and invisible, rank after rank after rank of angels, everything got started in him and finds its purpose in him. Wow, he 
was there before any of it came into existence and holds it all together right up to this moment. The eternal creator is Jesus, and then he is the recreator. He creates the church, which is you and me, not a physical building, not a denomination, but hundreds of millions and billions of people who are called out of darkness. Sins are forgiven. Holy Spirit comes to live within them. They become God's temple, and then he gets them congregating together in churches, groups like this. A church means ecclesia. Ecclesia, which means a called out assembly, called out of darkness. No longer any allegiance to Satan or sin or self, but now our allegiance is to Him. We're called out and we serve His purposes, whether we do it here or in a tent or in a small groups or, or, or wherever. And He says, and when it comes to the church, He organizes and holds it together like a head does a body. Where would our bodies be if we didn't have a head? Dead. The church cannot function, cannot be what it is without a living head. He is the Savior, the recreator. He was supreme in the beginning, I love this, and leading the resurrection parade, he's the first that rose from the dead, he is supreme in the end. We're going to rise from the dead. From beginning to end, he's there, towering far above everything and everyone. So spacious is he, so roomy, I love this, that everything of God finds its proper place in him without crowding and look at this this Jesus who's the creator of the physical universe this Jesus is the recreator of the spiritual universe salvation this Jesus is also the restorer of all things what's gone wrong with the physical world is is as awful as what went wrong with us the cosmic confusion all the the pain and suffering and evil that's within our world look what it says not only that but all the broken and dislocated pieces of the universe, people and things, animals and atoms, get properly fixed and fit together in vibrant harmonies, all because of his death, his blood that poured down from the cross. So he says he is going to bring it all together. And you read Revelation chapter 21, 20, you read the final chapters of Revelation, and then read Genesis 1 and 2. And it's like restoring the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. That's the church. It's a bride and bridegroom. This is like and saying there's no more tears, no more suffering, no more pain, no more sin, no more death. The devil has been thrown into the lake of fire. He's going to restore all things. What went wrong on this earth? What went wrong within our universe? He's going to restore it all together. This is who our Jesus is. The creator, the savior, the restorer praise his name. Let's stand together.